I'm freezing, I'm hypothermic. And we slipped in the water and we couldn't believe what we saw. The penguins were beautiful. At this point, I didn't care if a leopard still came and killed me. I mean, I'm living a dream at this point. I could care less. We're having so much fun. This is where March of the Penguins ended, when you've got all these emperor penguins jumping into the water. And for myself as a photographer, I stare at that thin blue line of water or ice where animals enter that world, and I am so hungry to know what it looks like down there that I'll almost do anything to get in there and see what, what, what's going on. But we've seen them on the surface. And here's a little video clip of what they look like when they flop into the water. This was all shot by Yoran uh, Elme on our project. Much more graceful in the water. So this was our home for the next month. And just to give you an idea of scale and size, and this is very important, this is where we were working, right in here. This iceberg right here is probably four or five times bigger than this National Geographic building. This iceberg is probably 100 times the size of this building. It's probably 75 feet tall from ice to top and several hundred feet deep underwater and almost half a mile, say, and half a mile, massive chunks of ice. But this set up for a, the perfect season for us to go work with emperor penguins. Usually there's chaos and ice breaking up, but this ice, the way it formed in this bay, provided a nice little sheltered area for us to work. And so we got into camp. We, we, we flew in by helicopter, we set up our camp. We were like kids in a candy store. We were so excited. We packed up our snowmobile, packed up our equipment. We raced out to the sea ice the first day. It was getting late in the evening, and we slipped in the water, Yodan and I, and we couldn't believe what we saw. The penguins were beautiful. The visibility was probably close to 1,000 feet. It was unbelievable to see this. But what was really exciting is when we were on our way to Antarctica, we couldn't believe the news we got, that scientists had come out with this, this uh, paper saying that emperor penguins released millions of microbubbles around their entire body as they raced to exit the surface, and it acted like a lubricant to reduce the friction and the drag around their body so they could increase speed to exit the water to A, gain height, but more importantly, to avoid the predation of leopard seals. And so now we had this new science, and we were so excited that our project now had more meaning and more weight. It was lucky that we had to wait the six years for this project to come to fruition. And so all we saw that first day were a few microbubbles coming out of this one penguin, but we were hopeful to return the next day. That night, we went back to our camp by snowmobile, and as we're heading home, we see all these weird marks in the snow and these belly drags, and we didn't realize that all the penguins, the teenagers get bored. And so the, the teenagers will leave the colony. They're not going out to sea to feed, and they're just kind of hanging out. And so they love to inspect anything that's new, airplanes, tents, camp. They love the color red. And you know, I was sitting there on my first night. I went to bed. It was about minus 20. I'm in my sleeping bag, and I've got these three penguins right outside my tent, pretty much leaning against my tent. This is my tent here. And this is my, right where my bed was. And they're doing these huge, ka -ka 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 -ka, these big calls. And I've got tears rolling down my cheeks again. I'm going, oh, I'm living my dream. Instead of polar bears, you know, sniffing around my tent, now there are no polar bears here. And I, this is so romantic. By the third night, <laughs> this was getting really old. This, <laughs> this calling because it kept me up. I couldn't sleep. And on this project, I double shifted. I'd work underwater all day, and then I would work all night uh, photographing penguins above water. So I was working about 16 to 20 hours a day just to get this story done in a short amount of time. And so by the third night of the calling, I hate to admit this, but I'd walk outside and see these four foot tall emperor penguins, and they were starting to look like footballs, you know, and placed. <laughs> placed in those, those hold kickers that they use from football. And I just, I mean, of course, I've never heard of Penguin. They were amazing. But it, you know, I, sleep is important when you're working in this environment. So we returned back to the ice edge in the next day, all full of hope and so excited. And there's our old friend, the leopard seal. Yoran and I are high-fiving. We also have a surgeon with us, uh, Dr. Dean Gushy, in case we got hurt by anything or bitten by a leopard seal or whatever. And we, that was one of the protocol of working here. And there's a leopard seal. We're like, excellent. And there was this tiny hole in the ice. So the leopard seal disappeared. And if I say from here to the stage, 
is about, say, 12 feet away, 15 feet away. And I'm standing there, and Yoran is standing here, and I've got the doctor standing here, and the seal's gone, and we're looking, and we're looking, and we're looking. And all of a sudden, that seal exploded out of the water, and all I saw was an explosion of water. All I had time to do was raise my arm like this, and the seal's face, he was six feet high in the air. His face hit my face right here like this. His eye hit my face. He bounced off me, and well, I bounced off him, believe me. He was probably, he wasn't a big seal, luckily. He was probably maybe 600 pounds. But to say, oh, I just got charged and run over by a 600 pound grizzly bear, it's serious. I mean, I got hurt. He threw me off into the ice. I was bruised, I, I couldn't breathe, and I slid back down the wet ice where he brought all this water. He was lying there, and we're lying back to back, and we're both stunned. He's probably never seen, why do you guys laugh? This is serious. And he's probably never seen a person before. And, and he, I'm sure, now that I dove under that ice, you can look up and you can see people look just like penguins. And so when he came rocketing out of that water, you could see his, his mouth was open. He was coming in for the kill. He, and they can't catch op, uh, emperor penguins in the open water. We realized just on the first day, they have to do this ambush type attack. And so he came in to knock us over and he did. Well, they, the other two guys, Yoran and Dean got away. I was in the middle, he knocked me down, I couldn't breathe, we're lying back to back, I'm looking at him stunned, he's looking at me, and I didn't know if he was gonna bite me, but all he wanted to do was get back in the water. And later that day, the seal came out of the water again, made another mistake, and took our surgeon's arm in his mouth, and, but didn't bite, he just mouthed him gently, slipped back into the water, scared himself again. Now, important on this project is we brought along a bottle of scotch that was for emergency purposes only. And so we, we went back to camp and we hammered that thing like a, a salmon on a hoochie. I mean, we, <laughs> we drank that scotch so fast and uh, just because our nerves were shot. We had two attacks in one day. I was all banged up and bruised. I didn't know if I could continue for a few days. And so we went home, we didn't dive. We came back the next day and boom, a bigger leopard seal starts lunging at us. And that's where Yoran and I said, we could be done, this project's over. And if Yoran wasn't as experienced as he is, he was, sorry. This is, the, this is the special part of working with great people, is that he slowly processed this. And I mean, I was, I was finished, you know, two attacks in a, in a day, um, scotch is gone, I'm hurt. And Yulan's like, nope, this, this is the happy Swede now. He's like, we must solve this seal. Of course we're not finished, don't be silly. You know, we must continue. But we didn't die for three days. We stayed and we processed, we thought, we analyzed, we watched the leopard seals come and go. And then finally on the third day, we're just looking at each other and thought, you know what, we just gotta go for it. And again, this is overriding what your gun, gut instinct is telling you not to do. But we decided that we had to get in the water. And I took this picture of Yoran for insurance purposes pretty much. <laughs> But the water here is 28 degrees Fahrenheit, and, and it's so slushy that you can't see. As you swim, the ice is mixing with the salt water, and you can never see anything. So if something's gonna come and attack you, you know, it's gonna happen. You can't carry a knife or have a theory of how you're gonna get out of this. You just have to throw caution to the wind and just go for it. So we jump back into the water. And what was really amazing about this is that once we got back in the water, nothing came back to us. We were, they were in the area, but they left us alone, completely opposite to the, the leopard seals that we photographed on the Antarctic Peninsula. And what was, what's happening with these leopard seals, because they can't, believe it or not, a leopard seal sitting right here cannot catch these penguins, cannot catch these penguins. They're way too fast for a leopard seal. So what they do is they hide under here in the black with their, their back up against the ice. And as these penguins come and exit the water, the leopard seal intercepts them. And so that's why we, we couldn't see them under the ice. It was very black. Now, if you want to under, what do you, what do you think it sounds like under there, under the ice? It's kind of eerie. You have a lot of wet, mating weddell seals this time of year. Whether you're sitting on the ice or you're in the water, listen, this is what it sounds like when you're just wading in the water.
Pretty cool, huh? So you're, you're sitting there um, listening to this and you're you know, waiting for this leopard seal to go. You're, you can't feel your hands, you can't feel your face, you can't feel your feet. I mean, so that's the environment that you're working in now. There's no way that I would have, on my first, second, third, or fifth assignment, just jumped in and finished the story. It was through this process of learning through these assignments to uh, persevere through these situations. And on that day, magic happened. We were in the water, I was in the water alone, and I've got my legs locked underneath the ice so I can't move. And all of a sudden, about 200 penguins returned from the open sea. And it was just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And also realized right away that they accepted me, that I was not a threat. I was worried that I'd be perceived as a leopard seal or a predator. And this big penguin right here was actually laying against my head. And so I had him, and I was, I'm, I've got a fisheye wide angle lens on, and I'm actually using him to frame. So I'm thinking, well, he'll look good here if I can use him to frame the top part of my picture. And all of a sudden, these other penguins came rushing into the frame. And this is the picture that just won at the BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year. But we still never got our bubbles. We wanted to see this release of bubbles. So we waited. And I'm lying there again, frozen, in the blue water, staring into the blue water. There's nothing there. I've been in the water for about two hours, waiting and waiting. And all of a sudden, this penguin came by me. And it was like someone turned on a tap. And he had millions of bubbles pouring out of his feathers as he rocketed to the surface. And then I realized, as I'm watching these, this is where I love being the scientist, the biologist, and, and the photographer, and the conservationist all wrapped into one. You get to, to do so many things with these observations and pictures. And so the penguins are coming to the surface, and I realized that they were in control of when they released the bubbles. It wasn't something that just happened, that as they came to the surface, the bubbles expanded out of their feathers and lubricated their bodies. The ones just off to the side here, they didn't need to release any bubbles. The guys who were just under me saw me last second, like, oh, maybe we should speed up. And whoosh, they released this big gush of bubbles, and they just, you'd see them double or even triple their speeds as they released these bubbles from around their body, completely coating their bodies. Look at this one in full display. Bubbles coming off the crown of the head, so they would squash their crown feathers, and the air was forced out. They would release air out of their lungs, and that, all that air would run along their bellies. They, compress all the feathers on their back. Look at that, just compressing all the highest point of their body, the whole belly, they're, they're releasing bubbles, and then it just coats their whole body as they come to the surface, achieving incredible speeds. There's a closer look at bubbles pouring off the penguin. At this point, I didn't care if a leopard still came and killed me. I mean, this was, I'm living a dream at this point. I could care less. We're having so much fun, micro bubbles running down the belly of a penguin. And what was neat also is that these penguins could selectively, uh, you know, if I swam towards them, I just tried it once for fun to see what would happen. I swam towards them, and boom, they all exploded in bubbles together. Just they could release them instantly. And it was like swimming, you know, into the, the flares off a fighter jet where all the bubbles are pouring. And I was shooting 10 frames a second most of the time. I felt so bad for my editor, Sadie, because she had to look at 56,000 pictures. This whole thing was going on so fast. Everything I was like, brr, 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 you know, just hammering frames just to try and capture how fast this was. And uh, it was just happened so fast. And as I swam into these penguins, into these bubbles, this is one picture. And the next picture, was, which is one tenth of a second later, um, you can't see anything. It worked. I mean, I'm just surrounded in a sea of bubbles that look like stars, and there was no chance of seeing a penguin. Incredible escape strategies. And here's a penguin that's an individual penguin. As he's coming to the surface, it swims in a corkscrew fashion, and it, it's doing this, so I think it's doing this, so it can look 360 degrees. It's alone. It doesn't have other emperor penguins watching its back. So now as it rockets to the surface, it's alone, corkscrew, and it creates this beautiful pattern as it comes to the surface. So this is how it happens. This is, I'm going to talk you quickly through the physiology, the biology of what happens. These penguins return from sea where they dive to depths up to 1,700 feet deep. They're feeding on ice fish. They're getting fish out from underneath the ice. They're eating squid and krill. And so they've now, they've been at sea for up to a month, three weeks to a month. And they've come back now to the ice edge. And their whole goal is to get a belly full of food, about six pounds of food, and get it back to their chicks. So, but now, believe it or not, this distance right here is the danger distance. Right here, this penguin's safe. But you know, once it commits to a, an exit trajectory, then it's in danger. So what it's doing is it stopped here. At first, I was wondering what it was doing, if it was bathing or not. But it's fluffing up his feathers. He's filling his feathers uh, full of air. And you can see him diving here. You can see his feathers here are all sort of 
all fluffed up. And, and as he's diving, he's got a, a, a lungs full of air. He's spilling off some air, diving down, some extra air spilling off his feathers. And it was interesting, the scientist said, it's impossible for emperor penguins to release air when they're diving down. It only comes out when, they, when it comes up. And so that's where it's fun to play biologist as well and say, well, actually, here's a picture of them diving down, releasing a fair amount of bubbles. But what they do is now they're worried about the leopard seal. This is their moment that they're vulnerable when they have to exit the water. So they go down to about 30, 40 feet deep. And this water is so clear, you can watch the whole show go on. 30 to 40 feet deep, they're milling around, and they're, they're looking up, and they're constantly sending out like work parties to go look under the ice, looking for leopard seals. And once they're sure the coast is clear, they start to exit one by one. And look at that jet stream of air coming off that penguin as they rocket to the surface. When there was a leopard seal in the area, they released more bubbles. When there was not a leopard seal there, they knew they were quite relaxed. So there was probably a leopard seal hiding underneath that ice because they were really nervous, releasing a lot of bubbles. And this is when they get hit. We saw some penguins get taken, but when you get this chaos like this, they create too many bubbles just for themselves. And so penguins swimming through this and all that chaos going on, that's when the leopard seal can come out and whack a penguin and take it. And these penguins weigh you know, anywhere from 60 to 90 pounds. If you can imagine, that's a lot of food for, uh, for a leopard seal. So this is Yoran's video uh, of the emperors exiting the water. You'll see how fast they are. There's probably a leopard seal there when they're going that fast, releasing that much air. And this is slow motion of the same thing. Just look at the bubbles pour off their bodies. So when there's not a leopard seal there, they don't need to, they, they're very relaxed. They don't jump very high. So these guys are just clearing the ice just enough to land on top of it. You know, this guy's super relaxed. You can see the little spirals of water patterns going down his back. And this is where I was just having fun. I mean, it was so hard to get this picture. Out of 56,000 frames, probably 12 to 15,000 frames were of just this happening. Because you would be all lined up, ready to shoot. And you, you couldn't look through the viewfinder because it happened so fast. And you'd be hammering away, and penguins would be flying on either side of you. And you're missing the picture. There's another one coming out of the water. But this is when there's a leopard seal there. When there's not a leopard seal there, they barely clear the ice. When there's a seal there, these guys, they get incredible heights, you know, four or five feet in the air. And then they land on the ice, and they're really funny because they, they land so, they go so high, and they land, they knock the air out of themselves. So they go, poof, ee! It pushes the air past their, their vocal cords. So it sounds like a little rap concert when you get it like, poof, ee! And you get a whole bunch of them coming out. It's kind of fun to watch. So this is one trying to avoid his buddy. There's a leopard seal here for this. They can't wait to get out of the water. It's amazing they don't break. They're, they're so tough. That's a leopard seal is right there under the ice trying to get them. And that's why they're coming out in such mass. They're panicking now. They just want out of the water. And the final image of the coverage uh, of an emperor penguin launching out of, out of the water. And it was amazing for me at this point, near the end of the shoot, photographing these pictures and watching these emperor penguins, realizing that he had, they had evolved this incredible, incredible physiological adaptation to release bubbles to avoid uh, leopard seal predation. And yet, the one thing that they couldn't prevent, the one thing they had no control over, is the loss of sea ice, the loss of their habitat. And that's what we're causing with these penguins. Our carbon emissions, our warm, us causing the temperatures to warm, are causing this sea ice to disappear. And these emperor pe penguins, just like the seals, like the polar bears, they need this ice as part of their ecosystem. And I really just want everybody the only way I can see change happening is that we think about money all the time. We think about our families. We think about love. You know, we, th we think about all these things. We need to start factoring the environment into all, our, all, of our, all of our thinking and our thought processes every day. When you buy something, a vehicle, a car, a house, or you know, whatever you're doing, the holiday where you're going to go with your family, is this good? Think about the emperor penguins. Think about the polar bears. We, if we're going to have any hope, and reversing the, the tremendous warming changes happening in the polar regions, and we have to start changing our own behavior now. Thank you very much.